Uh, but today we are truly excited to have Seth Henderson uh, with us. Uh, he's put together an excellent team of professionals in his summit development group to focus on the landfill. And a lot of you may go, well, I thought there was already a project that was going on the landfill 10 years ago. <laughs> there was. Uh, the fellow who did Bridgeport over there in Tualatin was looking to bring Cabela's to that location. Uh, he had a tremendous vision, uh, invested several million dollars, but unfortunately was never able to complete his vision and get it off the ground. So here we are 10 years later, we're gonna revisit that whole North End District, focusing specifically today on the proposed Abernathy Green Project. It consists of about 62 acres. Many of you know it as the driving range and some of the surrounding wetlands around that. We have the Home Depot and we have the tire factory. But it was identified as one of eight regional centers by Metro years ago. And some of the other eight regional centers that we have in our region is Clackamas Town Center, Washington Square, Cruise Way. And if you've ever been to any of those locations, you probably see a lot more retail, commercial, office, medical facilities that already exist. And you're probably wondering, well, what's, why isn't this happening here in Oregon City at the intersection of 205 and 213? Well, we're also all asking that same question. And hopefully today, Seth can go ahead and give you some ideas as to what could be uh, as long as we just keep moving forward. Uh, it should produce about 3,000 total jobs, construction jobs, a thousand of them will be uh, permanent or temporary in various pay scales. Um, but I don't want to get steal any more of his thunder. He's got a lot of slides to share with you. But I did want to uh, acknowledge and recognize some of our elected officials we have here today. Clackamas County Commissioner Mark Scholl. There we go. And Oregon City Commissioner Mike Mitchell. There we go. And the ladies from Clackamas River Water. Could you stand up? And that would be Tessa and Sherry. Thank you for coming. So like I said, I don't want to steal any more of Seth's uh, thunder, but the Abernathy Green Project is not an easy development to put together. Uh, last month you heard the need for more housing. That project it would be shovel ready to go ahead and produce over 500 new homes or multifamily units in it. It's not something that has to be annexed. It's not something that has to go through a lot of approvals. It received unanimous approval by the Oregon City Planning Commission already. So the, the time is now. Um, and with that being said, the time is now for you to come up. Okay. Whoop. There you are. Great. Good afternoon. So uh, first off to OCBA, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Seth Henderson. I'm here representing Summit Development Group. We have been working on this site for three years now. So there is a tremendous amount of information that I am going to attempt to get through in about half an hour to 45 minutes. I wanna make sure I leave time for questions. So first off, let's see if the pointer works here. Nice. Uh, you'll notice that um, it has been, I'm sorry? Point, uh, no, 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 I'm pointing. Can you see the laser pointer? Can everybody see that? So you'll notice uh, the last time I was here was about 23 months ago. And so the first slides we're gonna run through gives all the history of what we've done to date. And so that portion I'll try to get through relatively quickly. This is actually number 15 of the presentations that we're giving in February, March, and April. So we're going to every single neighborhood association, every professional organization within Oregon City um, that has asked us to come and present. So, uh, I, I recognize a lot of faces. There's people that are probably seeing this information for a third, fourth, or as Mike is uh, 
April, fifth, sixth time, something like that. Uh, Mike was actually on the planning commission when we originally took this through. So uh, I'll probably throw out some anecdotes about how hard he was on us. Uh, so just very quickly about me, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but um, developers, a lot of them come from the finance side. They know how to build a project in a pro forma and on paper. I am from the execution side, so civil engineering, general contracting, and so the team I put together is, is all about execution in this project. As we go through the information, you'll see this is an extremely challenging project. There's a reason why this landfill has been sitting there for four decades. There's a reason why there's 55 landfills in the Portland metro area alone that no one's addressed. They are very difficult projects. Um, down below, you'll see uh, some of the projects that Summit Development is doing. If you've never heard of Summit Development Group, we are a local developer. So carpetbagger is a term I've heard over the last three years. We, we are from the Tiger Triangle. Uh, we have employees that are in Portland, Lake Oswego, Canby. Every single one of our team members are local firm. So we're not importing labor, we're using the labor that's available here in Portland. And I'll talk a little bit about jobs, but during the construction process, it's 3,000 construction jobs. So where exactly is the site? Um, there's a better slide a little further up that'll zoom in on it, but in general, you can see where the downtown is. Um, Oregon Trail Interpretive Center, end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center. Here's the site, and then Home Depot right next to it. So it kind of sits in that corner of Washington 205, 213. So what is the zoning? The zoning here is mixed use downtown. When you look at the zoning for Oregon City, by far, the, the most dense zoning is MUD. So it's limited in terms of where it is in the city. It's essentially extending the downtown. And you can see that purple, there's some industrial mixed in. But mixed-use downtown, and that is not readable, but um, mixed-use downtown, the whole idea is exactly the way it's defined, exactly the way that it sounds. The intent is to extend the downtown through that area. So mixed uses, first floor, active retail, office, active uses. Above that, residential. So that is the intent. And when we went through the planning commission, they actually read this and re reiterated that these narratives in each one of the code sections, that's the vision the city has. That's what they want executed on the site. Um, permitted uses, the ones that are highlighted, which again, unfortunately, is unreadable, but um, it talks about um, multifamily, museums, retail, both boutique and large format, um, child care, indoor active entertainment. So you start getting the idea, what, what do you actually find in a downtown area? And just to keep in mind the size of the site, it's 62 acres. Your standard downtown block is about 200 feet by 200 feet or 40,000 square feet, which is less than an acre. So you're talking about an eight block by eight block square area. So this is essentially a, the end or north end of the downtown district. Um, conditional uses, there's only one conditional use we've asked for, and that's drive-through. And it's interesting because when people hear drive-through, they immediately think food service. Based on the last pandemic, all retail wants drive-through. So for instance, a bank, drive-through. Um, Zoom care, they want to drive-through. So we have five conditionally approved drive-throughs. I can tell you right now, they're not all food service. And you'll see when we get to the site plan, they're spread throughout the site. Under prohibited uses, people have asked us, why aren't you doing single family homes? Well, single family homes, duplexes, townhomes are prohibited. Not to mention, I'll talk about a prospective purchaser agreement that we put in place with the DEQ. 
anybody that owns any portion of this site would have to sign on to that agreement and take on that liability. And you're not gonna get single family homeowners that wanna take on environmental liability. Down in the right hand section, it kind of talks about the interesting thing about MUD, because that's where the city wants density, most of the requirements are minimums. So the minimum FAR, floor area ratio or density, is 0.3. They don't give a maximum, they give you a minimum. 75 feet is the height limit. Your standard building, 15 feet on the first floor, 10 feet for every floor above, that's a seven story building. So your maximum is essentially seven to one, and then as you add roads and other things on site, that are roads. So you're somewhere between 0.3 and seven to one. And we'll talk, uh, actually I'm not sure it's in the slides. Our, our density for the site as proposed is 0.44. So we are down near the minimum because we are trying to figure out what is the right amount of density to limit the amount of public funds to, to clean up the site while at the same time not negatively impacting the community, but also providing the services that we've heard the city wants to see on the site. So if you start thinking about a Venn diagram and you've got one circle, which is code and all the requirements for the site, and another circle, which is what the community wants, and then another circle, which is what we can finance. Because if we show you a great vision, but we can't actually execute on it, what's the point? And where those three circles meet on this project with its complexity is tiny. And we're trying to hit that. So this zooms in now so you can actually see the site. And what isn't shown is this property line right here goes to about here. And this whole area back here, if you drive Redland Road, you look off to your left-hand side, there's a ravine right there. It is one of the few areas on the site that's not on top of trash. What does that mean? It means we can use it for natural infiltration. It's currently acting as stormwater management. There's a culvert that runs underneath Abernethy, right there to Abernethy Creek. Our intent is to break that out as a separate legal parcel, donate it to a nonprofit so they can return it to the wetlands condition. If you are a big fan of the driving range, yes, we are getting rid of the driving range. I've had two people accost me in regards to that, but uh, since nobody here is, is yelling currently, I take it not a lot of people spend time there. Um, it does not include the county parking lot, the other properties along Abernethy, the interpretive center or the lawn and garden center. And if you've ever driven to Home Depot, you see two giant concrete blocks right there. That's where we're continuing the road all the way across. So th does that give everybody a pretty good idea of the property we're talking about? All right, so why is this such a challenging site? In addition to being a landfill where you have the environmental and geotechnical challenges, you also have the floodplain so this shows along Washington, along Abernethy, and then that, that area we were talking about, that's all within the floodplain. You're also looking at your cut and fill. You've gotta have balanced cut and fill within your floodplain. 1996 flood, you can actually see the interpretive center where it's gone up to those wagons. You can see all the county buildings. You can actually see the telephone poles that tell you where Abernethy is. And then you see this piece of land popping up. So this is the only positive I'm gonna tell you about this site all day today. If you're looking for a silver lining, having a giant pile of trash to build on, you are above the floodplain for the majority of the areas. So, so people have said, why, why would you build this development in a floodplain? Only two areas are in the floodplain along Washington where we're putting the parking garage. And if you look at city code, parking's fine because as the water rises, you're getting cars out of there. The issue is buildings you can't move. And then on Abernethy, you have parking lots. So those are acceptable uses within the floodplain and that's what we have in those two limited areas. All right, then you've got natural resource overlays on site. You also have, we talked about the height restrictions, and it's actually great. If you look in the city code under MUD, 
there's certain areas that the city has said, this is sensitive, this is important to us, enough that we're actually going to write it into the code. And one of those is the interpretive center. So you'll see this kind of ring right here. Anything within 500 feet of the end of the Oregon Trail interpretive center is 45 feet. So they've cut 30 feet off the allowable height. And that's obviously not to shadow that property. It, it's rare that you will actually see specific properties called out in the zoning code. And then you have geological hazard. So this is interesting. The geological hazard zone was written around building a house along a natural slope. So the edge of the bluff, the house is there. How are you making sure they're not sliding down during a seismic event? Well, unfortunately, it also applies to man-made slopes. So you can see the percentage of slopes that we have. What are those slopes? In most occurrences, it's where they filled it up with trash and then pushed soil to back it up. So you're driving down Washington Street, you look to your left-hand side, you'll see berms along there. That is soil that's been pushed up to withhold the trash layer. So we're gonna talk a little bit about retaining walls. We have to dress all those slopes on site with either grading and layback or retaining walls. Um, so again, this is showing a presentation from 23 months ago. So some of the information over on the right-hand side is no longer accurate. Those have changed. But in terms of the layout of the site, this is exactly what we have shown for three years. Two, two years, six months. So a little further on, we'll get to a Gantt chart, which I'm sure everybody's really excited about, but it shows what we've done for the last three years. And so we put this in contract in March of 2020, I joined Summit in April of 2020. We put together our team over the next four months. During those four months, we reached out to the community and said, what do you want on the site? So before we ever put pen to paper, before we had even put our team together, and it was a very organic process. So it was, hey, you're right next to the interpretive center. Have you gone and talked to Gail? Have you walked the site with her? Understood how your site's gonna impact the interpretive center? How are you gonna connect to it? And then businesses downtown, a lot of people have concerns about the impacts of your retail to the businesses downtown. Have you spoke with Liz Hannum, executive director of DOCA, and kind of talked about what businesses should be on your site and what should you avoid? So we took that information, built a master plan or a general development plan, and we've stayed consistent. And one of the things I heard probably for the first year and a half, actually, let's be honest, I'm still hearing it today. There have been developers that have come into Oregon City and said, here's this beautiful picture and this is what we're gonna produce. And then they produce this. And so there's this doubt about developers and whether they actually take the information in and apply it and whether they're consistent with that information. And so part of the reason why I'm going back to these slides is to show you the very gradual progression but we have stuck to what we have said we are producing for this community based on the community's input. It's such a large site, you'll see we broke it into four districts. The north district, that has the most density, that has the housing, why? Because Washington Street's right there. So we're trying to push that density onto Washington Street, which is a minor arterial road with the phase one jug handle project, making it easy to get from 205 to 213 to Washington Street and vice versa, that's where you want your trips generated. It's not on Abernathy. So that's why we've pushed that housing and density there. This large building, that's our active inter indoor entertainment. Originally, that was gonna be a cinema and we had a discussion with Rachel Lyle Smith when she was still commissioner, before she was mayor, and she said, you know what we really need? We need multi-generational, year-round, indoor entertainment, and make it active. So that changed kind of our mindset in terms of what, what users are we looking for. We then had a discussion with the Tamwata Middle School. Um, does anybody here have kids or grandkids that go to Tamwata Middle School? E Evan Howes. 
an amazing teacher. I, I wish I had teachers like him. So he engaged us and said, every year we do an open space study of a property within Oregon City and get the next generation to say, what do we want to do there? And it was 300 eighth graders. They were broken up into between 70 and 75 groups of four to five. We had almost like a science fair type environment and they presented to us and said, this is what we want. To the group, a place for them to get together does not exist in Oregon City. They go to Clackamas Town Center, they go to Bridgeport Village, and they go to the library. And so they said, if you can give us something where we can hang out with our friends and an inclusive space where we feel safe, that is a huge benefit to the community, something that does not exist today. Just a couple other quick comments. So the five U-shaped buildings, those are your residential buildings. There's one drive-through, there's one drive-through, there, there, and there, so we spread them out. Larger format retail, and then broke that up as well. Um, we'll talk about one specific entity that has approached us about being on the site. When the, um, when the courthouse moves from downtown up to Red Soils campus, which I believe is about May of 2025, DOCA has did a study prior to the pandemic, and they estimated about 12.8 million in revenue generated for the downtown businesses by people working at and going to the courthouse. So in addition to that, there's 80 to 100 offices within the downtown that support the courthouse. So one of the things we heard is, in a normal downtown, you would think, yeah, we need office. What we heard early on, please limit your office because we have concerns that there will be empty office in the future. Um, when we go through the projects that are currently um, priority projects for urban renewal, the Stimson property is one of them. If you review the 11th Amendment, that is supposed to be a Class A office. So these I'm going to fly through. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, these are just showing the different ways of transportation on the site. So the one on the left, you've got uh, your bike path going all the way through. That's actually one of the city's TSPs. Um, it's something that ODOT is excited about as well, which is moving cars from Abernathy to Washington. Again, we explained why Washington is the priority street. Uh, all the red on the left, that's all your vehicle travel on site. Again, you're building an extension of the downtown. And then on the right is all your pedestrian connections, including a direct connection to the Interpretive Center. Uh, this is just showing kind of the Market Street area. I, again, we're just calling it Market Street today. Um, and that gives you an idea. When you're driving up, those will all be, there's a limit, I think it's 25 feet is the minimum height within MUD. So those will all be one story, but they're going to have variation. Um, they're gonna, it's going to feel like you're driving into kind of the downtown Main Street or an extension of the historic downtown. We're not trying to replicate it. If you've ever seen people try to replicate a historical area, it, it, it never goes well. So we're trying to figure out how can we augment what Oregon City currently has. The other thing around mixed use in general, the whole intent is to have people live, work, shop, and be entertained all within the same area. You're looking for activity throughout the day. And I don't know if anybody's been to downtown recently at about 9, 10 o'clock at night during the workday. It, it is very quiet. And part of that is because there are no residential units in downtown Oregon City, which is an anomaly. Most main streets, you have that additional activity. One of the drawbacks of having all this amazing historic history, you have unreinforced masonry buildings. It's very difficult to convert to residential. Uh, just some of the ideas in terms of architecture. Um, some people have said you're building a Bridgeport Village. Some people have said you're building a Washington Square Mall. Uh, understand that's not our intent. This is not going to be modern architecture. Again, how do we augment the existing downtown but differentiate enough? 
These are all the kind of breakout public outdoor areas on the site. Some of those are pedestrian walkways. This is showing the central square. So if you think about, right, your residential, your main entertainment center, retail on the backside, those two boxes right there are restaurants. So another thing we heard, there are a substantial number of food service restaurants in Oregon City. Please limit the number of restaurants that you have. We currently show two. They're in this plaza area. You think about outdoor seating. That's why they're located here. Uh, this is actually one of the images that I like the most. So when you're driving along Washington Street, there's this elevation right there on the corner. And how can we actually make that something? If this is part of the north gateway to the downtown, how do you make this site feel welcoming? Well, one way to do it is a vertical park. So we're gonna have a lot more trees, that, that's much more arid, but we're looking at using natural basalt and stacking it, so there's a vertical park area there where people can kind of hang out, eat lunch in the shade. Um, but again, this is showing all the different locations on site where they're kind of breakout areas for people to hang out. Um, obviously, based on the size of the site, you need pedestrian connection between all the areas. This is showing some of the ideas of what those connections might look like. Um, the main one that runs right through the site here, that is pedestrian only. So there are no cars on that. And then this obviously fronts the, the retail on the back side. And then you've got your sidewalks around all of these buildings. Uh, stormwater, so on our site, because it is a landfill, one, we have to do an impermeable surface for the entire site, and two, we have to manage all the stormwater. The stormwater is managed in two ways. You have these flow-through stormwater planners, that's your initial filtration, and then you have large subgrade stormwater vaults. That is also a secondary filtration system before it goes to Abernathy Creek, potentially to the cove, increase flow there, get rid of the hazardous algae blooms. This is the jug handle phase one project. Uh, I could spend a half an hour on transportation, but I'm gonna go through these slides pretty quick. Again, the idea behind the jug handle phase one was anticipating future development along Washington Street. And just so everybody knows, it originally was just the jug handle project, and there wasn't enough financing. So now it's multiple projects, and part of our project is actually addressing that second phase. This is showing the different types of uh, improvements that we end up having to do, and there's, there's better slides coming up. This is telling you about, uh, when assessing a site, you have to do what's called a transportation impact analysis, or TIA. And the way that occurs is you're using a baseline the city has. So their TSP, which was last updated in 2013, but it's going to be updated again soon. I'm, I'm looking at Director Lewis right now. He's nodding. Um, and you, the, your transportation engineer sits down with the city's transportation engineer, and you negotiate what your scope of work will be. So... When the city did their TSP, they looked through 2035, what is the growth going to be, what are our priority projects, and let's look at these 21 major intersections and understand how those intersections need to be improved or other roads need to be improved to take on the anticipated growth in jobs and population. Our transportation impact analysis assessed 25 off-site and five on-site. So we did 30 intersection studies. You have to study, and you guys probably can't read it, but you actually have to study baseline uh, 2025 with the development, 2025 without the development. Then you're also studying weekday peak in the morning, weekday peak in the evening, and Saturday, I think it's 11 to 1. So you're doing three conditions, three times, three times during the day or the week, and then 30 intersections. So that is 270 models. 
our appendices to our general development plan for transportation is over 1,500 pages. So in terms of detail that we've assessed the transportation and infrastructure system, for a private development, I've never seen anything of this magnitude. Only two intersections do not operate per engineered. And that is Holcomb, Redland, Abernethy, and then Redland to 213. So both of those intersections we have to upgrade, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. This is showing uh, the TSP intersections, showing our intersections. All right, so now we get to the general development plan. So we submitted our general development plan, I believe, April 1st of 2021. So we've, we've put our team together, we've taken in community input, we've now put it together. Um, it's about 2,000 pages, including all the appendices. And just so you understand, general development plan, it's a master plan. It's the big box in which we need to work as we're identifying all the existing buildings that all goes through a detailed development plan. One other quick comment. This is a massing diagram. So you will probably see this illustration talking about our project. It's just showing the massing of the buildings. We are not building a bunch of stark white buildings. So no architecture or materials or color has been incorporated. Okay, so what did we actually submit? This should look very familiar because it's exactly what we reviewed with the community prior to submitting it. So again, you've got your five residential buildings, your two restaurants, your active indoor entertainment, your market street, your drive-throughs, your large format retail. One other thing to comment on here. A lot of comments. Wow, it looks like you're building a lot of parking lots. Well, that's because it doesn't show the 785 trees we have to add to the site or the almost 4,000 shrubs. So once you put those in, the site actually looks a lot different. So this is the landscaping guidelines page directly from our GDP and what was approved. Uh, by the way, we, I, I think there were three, we pre presented at two and then the third was the vote and that was July of 2021. At that time there were six planning commissioners voting, six zero, a unanimous support of this project, no appeals. So as it sits today, we have unappealable entitlement rights for our general development plan. Um, a lot of questions come up in regards to what are you doing off-site? How are you improving Abernethy, Washington, Redland 213? So these are cross sections directly from our general development plan and it might be difficult to read, but for Abernethy Road, turn lane, travel lane, bike lane, all the street trees, sidewalk, Washington Street, turn lane, two travel lanes, bike lane, curbside parking, street trees, sidewalk. And right now, the, sh the street ends somewhere in here. So we're essentially buying land, designing, engineering, permitting. Um, we'll talk a little bit how it's going to be constructed, but then turning around and dedicating it to the city. All the streets on site, because it's on a landfill and there was some concern around the city taking on liability of infrastructure on a landfill, they're all private roads with public use easements, which means we have the long-term maintenance for all of those roads. We're not passing that on to the city. Can I get a nod? Yes. Okay. <laughs> And I thought this would be impactful. Um, I actually took my daughter out. She's huge into photography, and we took photos of, of all the conditions. So this is actually at uh, where Abernethy meets Redland and Holcomb. And this is looking back. That right there is where the sidewalk ends. This is where you get to stand in the rain for the bus in the middle of Blackberries. 
This is near the Lawn and Garden Center. That's where the sidewalk ends. And this is looking up Abernethy near uh, the county parking lot. And you better have your galoshes or be very brave because you don't have any other options. So we're, we're improving all the Washington Street frontage, all the Abernathy Street frontage. We're widening Redland. We're adding a right turn lane off 213 on the Redland, adding a right turn lane off Redland onto 213 so you have three continuous lanes. At least that is the engineered plan. Okay, Gantt chart. Yes, exciting, great. Um, so off the bat, PSA in place, that says March of 2020. Um, we then put together the design team four months. We talked about that. We did community outreach. We then went through the entitlement process April through August of 2021. All of our public outreach, and that was first go around. This is now second go around of public outreach. We've been working on pre-con, so figuring out what is the cost of all these off-site improvements, what's the cost of mass grading, the methane gas mitigation system, surcharging on site, impermeable surface, stormwater, funding DEQ oversight through 2056. So putting all that information into our model. Okay, so again, consistency, right? Everybody has seen this before. This is our first DDP. So once you have your general development plan or master plan, you now have to do a detailed development plan around all the individual scopes of work and how you break up the parcels. So we could have somewhere between 20 and 25 individual detailed development plans for this project. This is the first one, mass grading retaining walls. So we talked about all those steep slopes on site, right? So there's three locations where you're driving up by Home Depot, the back side of the property to protect that natural resource overlay area, and then most of this southwest corner actually has elevation grade differences. This shows, so again, I'm kind of showing an example of what do these DDPs look like that we're now working on kind of next stage moving this project forward. So this shows all the different block types. This is showing, and I think I probably cut half the slides out of this DDP to try to speed it up. So this is just giving you an idea, it's showing you the elevation of that backside, what the blocks could be, why you have to have blocks there. This is showing that elevation. This is the lawn and garden, interpretive center, county parking lot, retaining wall, that entire area. Then you start looking at, for instance, this area. How do you do vegetation, either a vertical vegetated wall, vegetation in front? Obviously, we don't want retaining walls exposed all the way around the site. So what can you do to, to enhance the, the visual component of those retaining walls? Then we start talking about the ramp to the interpretive center. So one of our conditions of approval, we have 81 conditions of approval with all the subsections, it's about 150. And one of those is a connection, which is one of the city's TSP projects to the interpretive center. And so this is one idea that we came up with, which is as you go from Independence, Missouri to Oregon City, what does the elevation look like? And what are the major milestones? And how might that look as a map on a wall? Obviously, this is east and this is west, right? And then how does that ramp actually look if you want to avoid skateboarders and bikes plowing down it on a daily basis? So we kind of broke it up a little bit. And this also leads from the corner of the interpretive center up to, this is kind of the corner of the entertainment building, so it's trying to get close to that center square area. One of the things Gail was really excited about, there's no food and bev currently at the interpretive center. You're a family, you're there for the day exploring, your kids get hungry, you're leaving. And so this is a direct connection to food and bev options for the interpretive center. 
And then what about doing plantings from each one of those regions as you're going east to west? So again, this was just a concept, and then we sent it out to Gail and said, Gail, what do you think about this? And then we sent it to Jerry Herman and said, Jerry Herman, what do you think about this? And so getting all that input and then our engineering team putting it together into a detailed development plan to submit to the city. So that's the first DDP we're working on. Now we're talking also to potential tenants and also assessing what tenants should we be talking to based on all the uses the community has told us they want. So one of the ones we've been talking to is the Winterhawks and the potential for that entertainment center. Disclaimer, as a developer, this is a snapshot in time. This is where we sit today. So everything we're reviewing, do we go into a recession? Do certain industries end up getting hit and no longer want to expand? There's a lot of things we can't control. But this is the best information we have today. So nobody accosts me on sidewalk in six months because these people are no longer interested. That's the point. So Winterhawks. We talked about that location. So um, I had said some of the square footages had changed from when we took community input and when we submitted our GDP the last time we were here 23 months ago. The entertainment center has increased a bit because again, we've gotten input that this is a very important component that currently is missing. So it would actually be two sheets of ice, figure skating, ice hockey. It's actually two levels because of the grade there. It's directly off that plaza we talked about. You've got your entry, you've got shop, restrooms, locker rooms, utilities, uh, bistro, the offices for administration. And this kind of shows you the program when we sat down with them and went through, okay, what do you require? Um, and that's how we came up kind of with the amount of parking they need, all the different uses. And so this is kind of the analysis that we're doing for different potential uses and tenants. So this shows where that building would actually be. You can see the two restaurants with the green roofs. You can see the retail, the residential. And these are just some uh, precedent images. And again, we kind of submitted to this to Winterhawks and said, we heard your initial information are we close? So we're kind of having this dialogue back and forth. And they're also assessing their current facilities in the Portland metro area and saying, this is what we actually need. This is the ideal layout for us. If you're not familiar with the Winterhawks, um, their investment backers who purchase them are also the money behind the Kraken, the new NHL team in Seattle. So it's a very well-funded group. Dark Horse Comics. Um, Behind Marvel and DC, the third largest IP owner of comics. Um, if you've ever met Mike before, very interesting individual. They own a number of properties in downtown Milwaukee. Um, they are originally from Clackamas. They want to stay in Clackamas. And they're looking at consolidating some of their space. Um, I would say the Winterhawk conversation is much more advanced than this one, but we continue to kind of go back and forth because they're trying to figure out their business plan going forward. So now we're looking down where the retail was previously shown. Again, we're not interested in office which competes with potential empty office downtown in the future, but if a specific tenant comes and says, we're not going to Oregon City unless we have this infrastructure, then we will have those discussions because the downtown can't support what they're currently asking for. So I mentioned how there's a couple of buildings where because of the slope, it's two stories on one side, one story on the other. And this, again, this is preliminary discussions. That warehouse space has gotten smaller. Um, Soundstage, offices, museum. Um, Mike owns, he's got 100,000, I think it is, warehouse space in, in Milwaukee with uh, movie memorabilia from the last, let's see, 82, I think, was The Mask, which was their first movie. And so he's just collected movie memorabilia over those four decades. Um, and he's looking for a place to set up a museum. 
They also need a place for their main flagship retail store for all uh, aliens, predator, um, talked about mask, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the others. If you go to their website, you'll know a bunch of the, bunch of the stuff that's on there. They have five shows right now filming with Netflix. And then, there you go. He owns the 20-foot mother alien from the movie Aliens. So he's excited about putting that someplace. But uh, again, giving some conceptual ideas of what could their space look like. And then uh, the last thing I'll show you quickly is just an example of what if we're doing an assessment of space for multiple potential brands. So grocer. Um, Two different formats for grocer we're talking to. One, the ideal size is 12 to 14,000 square feet. The other one, it's about 22 to 24,000 square feet. And so there's two specific brands that we're talking to. We looked at three options for them. So one is consolidating those two buildings. And we looked at two different layouts for that space. We're trying to make sure, so code says you have to have pedestrian travel to the front door of the buildings. Um, and we're trying to get as much storefront as possible along those main walkways. We also look down in this corner. The challenge there is it's actually going to have to be a podium. Uh, it's going to be a much more expensive building. So I think one of the other two options probably works best. And that's it. That's three years of information in less than an hour. So not bad. So this is when I, I switched to uh, old school because I've carried this around to every meeting we've had. And there is a ballot measure coming up May 16th, which you may know about. And Urban renewal is a form of tax increment financing. And there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding around how does urban renewal and TIF actually work. This is, this is dollars, this is time. So this is your property taxes, naturally increasing every year, right? This is where the urban renewal district is established. So this is now your frozen base down here. This portion up here, that's your increment when they talk about tax increment financing. There is no urban renewal district. Your taxes are the same. Our project does or does not go forward. Your property taxes are the same. And so the entire intent behind this is how can we utilize property tax dollars to generate additional development which then creates more property tax dollars, which allows us to put more funding towards all the services required in the city. Um, let me give you an example. Today, the property taxes for the landfill, $25,000. That's what's paid. Our project completed conservatively $3.3 million. So if this ballot measure passes, Let's say the Urban Renewal Commission says, out of the 44 million, which is 35 million in bonding capacity, 9 million in what's been collected to date, let's say the Urban Renewal Commission says, we think this project brings 20 million of value to the city. Um, I would argue we bring a lot more, but let's say that's the number they put on it. So you've got a 20 year bond at about 5%. So, over those 20 years, the cost of that bond, principal interest, about 1.6 million. So less than half of the property taxes that are being generated from this property. So city has a number of options with that surplus each year. They can, one, pull another bond to support other projects based on that increase. They can, two, look at revenue sharing with other tax districts so police, fire, or three, um, they can pay that bond back in less than half the time. So that's entirely up to the Urban Renewal Commission, but that, that is the impact of just our project. The projects that are prioritized in that ballot measure, the Cove, 
the courthouse, the quiet zone, that's the railroad crossings downtown, the Stimson property, that's where the landscaping is right across Washington Street from where our site is, 12th and Main, that's the empty gravel parking lot that currently has a huge stormwater line that runs underneath it. I'm looking to John again. Uh, the Rossman landfill, and then the Interpretive Center has about three million in deferred maintenance items, right? Everybody see that empty frame as you drive by? Yeah, that's one of the components of those three million. So what are the benefits of our project? Prospective purchaser agreement. So we negotiated this with the Department of Environmental Quality, 700 individuals, state employees, environmental engineers, hydrologists, geologists. Their job is to enforce and regulate federal and state environmental law. And so what a PPA does for contaminated sites that are privately owned, how do you motivate the private sector to address those sites, especially since if it's a party that wasn't involved with the contamination, they're taking on that liability. So what the PPA does is the DEQ says, here's all the requirements you have to do. If you do these requirements, we're gonna back your liability. So we can't go out and get a, a loan from a bank if they go, wait, we loan you money and we take on this, all this environmental risk. So this is actually a requirement to get anything done on this site. And so what are the four things we're required to do? I've talked about them, so methane gas mitigation. So if you have a radon perforated pipe system underneath your house, it's the exact same idea. It's inline fans pulling methane out from underneath the buildings. Two, impermeable cap. So the, risk, the major risk on a landfill is leach it. That's when stormwater goes through the trash layer, picks up hazardous materials, heavy metals, takes it into the groundwater system. How do you prevent that? Well, you put an impermeable cap across the entire site. Okay, now that you have an impermeable cap, what are you doing with all the stormwater? So we talked about the stormwater. We've got the flow through planters and the stormwater vaults. And then the fourth item is we fund a trust fund. Our portion is $1,044,500. That is just for DEQ staff to monitor the groundwater condition and the methane gas through 2056, which is their sole discretion when they believe that this landfill, the, the solid waste permit, closure permit, can finally be closed. So they're looking at other landfills that are solid waste and saying, we believe by 2056, we can close this down. We want you to fund all of our services to make sure the site is safe until that date. So that's how we got the PPA. Property taxes we talked about, 25,000, 3.3 million. Housing, House Bill 2001, middle housing. Everybody know what that is? A lot of information out there. It's increasing housing supply by going into existing neighborhoods, large lots, and putting in duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, cottage clusters, and townhomes. 2889, that's the one currently going through Salem. This is the enforcement measure. So Oregon did a housing needs analysis. How many people here believe housing is an issue in Oregon? Okay, of the people that raised their hands, how many of you want that housing right next door to you? Exactly, and that's what the state has figured out. So what the state will do is for cities over 10,000, they're gonna start divvying out production goals for every city within Oregon. And there's gonna be a stick and a carrot to get the cities to uh, execute to those goals. So here's another question for you. 500 units, would you rather those be on the corner of 205 and 213 and the highest density zoning where utilities and infrastructure exists? Would you rather there be five individual 100 unit developments along the exterior of the city where utilities and infrastructure need to be upgraded where currently there's forest and farmland? Or would you rather 250 duplexes shoved into existing neighborhoods? So uh, the whole reason we believe this project makes sense is what's coming down the road. 
SDCs, our SDCs were estimated in August of 2021. SDCs increase pretty much every year during the summertime. Our SDCs will probably be between 27 and 28 million, I would guess. So that number was estimated at 26.1 million. And that is over 14 million in transportation, over 3 million in parks, and the rest of it is storm, sewer, water. So um, I don't think anybody will argue with me, but uh, Oregon City did do analysis comparing their SDCs to other cities within the Portland metro area. Oregon City is near the top on a lot of the SDCs. And part of that is because being the first city in the Oregon Territory, you're going to have some of the oldest infrastructure, right? And just some of the ge geographic challenges of the city. No, you got it. <laughs> um, so substantial SDCs. So when we were talking about 20 million and whether urban renewal would commit that and the payback that they're getting just from property taxes, it's 1.68, a dollar and 68 cents for every dollar committed over those 20 years. You throw in the X SDCs at 26.1, you're now at about $2.67 for every dollar committed. You throw in the 17 million in upgrades to 213 Abernathy, Redland, Washington, um, you're now up to, I think it's about $3.2 dollars per dollar committed. And that doesn't take into account what other developments occur because of this one. What does the land value for Stimson that the city owns, as well as the Cove, what happens to those land values? I mean, it's very easy that each dollar committed, it's 4x to 5x increase on actual benefit to the city. We talked about the infrastructure upgrades, all the services that we've proposed that the community has said they want on this site. Um, I'm excited to meet with Linda on Thursday and the Three Rivers Artists Guild to talk about what they need facility-wise and can we support that on our site. Art, one of our conditions of approval. We have eight pieces of public art, two in each district, and actually calls out the size of that art. And so we will be working with local artists to figure out what are those art pieces. Public parking. How many public parking spots are there downtown? The answer is usually not enough, but there, there's about 400 and there's about 800 private spots. On our site, we will be providing more than 500 public parking spots, more than all the downtown currently. Okay, that's great, Seth, but why would people then come to the downtown if they can come to your site and park? Well, that's why we need to get the soft wheel trolley system back. Uh, I don't want to hire those drivers or manage the maintenance, but we are more than willing to help finance getting those two trolleys back. Because if you start thinking about the Cove and the Red Soils campus and our project and Tumwata Village and the historic downtown and connecting all of that, well, this is a pretty good option. Watershed, so we are creating or returning 62 acres to the watershed for that area. So what can that water be used for? For instance, getting flow to the cove. Did Doug Neely leave? There he is. Does that sound good? You want to help me with that? Uh, jobs, so we talked about 3,000 construction jobs. The estimate is 988 jobs after completion. Public square, vertical park, we talked about that. Mixed use, the entire intent of mixed use and the benefits to a community by putting all those uses together. And then supporting the end of the Oregon Trail. So the food and beverage option, a direct connection. How do we get pe more people to the end of the Oregon Trail interpretive center? And I actually found it very interesting that our parks fee was for SDCs was about $3.04 and the estimate for deferred maintenance on the interpretive center was about three million. So anyway, that could be a solution. Okay, there we go, questions. Over here, over here. Wait. I am, I am the question man. So, all right, well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank Seth for just an amazing <laughs> and informative presentation today. As, as we started out at the very beginning, this particular location has been recognized as one of the eight 
regional centers throughout the entire metro region. And you can kind of see why. You can see with 62 acres, there's such an upside opportunity available, not only on that site, but all the other adjacent properties. And when you think of what's actually taken place in reality at Washington Square, at Cruiseway, at Clackamas Town Center, the, the anchor was the, the bigger projects. But think about all the other ripple effect, positive benefits, whoop, I'm told to get over here, positive benefits that came out of that initial investment. So you can say, well, you crawl before you walk, you walk before you run. Well, we, we got to get out of the crawling stage. We got to get out of the walking stage. We got to catch up. We're behind. We're way behind, really, by decades. So when you think about 27 million in SDCs, offsite road improvements that are badly needed, the additional economic benefit of the employment opportunities of 3,000 construction jobs, how, how do you measure all that? on the benefit on all the other local businesses that we have in our community already. To me, it's all upside, but it's not up to me. <laughs> so the, the big question, Seth, and I don't know if you want to answer this, I'm going to do it on a positive and a negative. Um, the positive, we always try to be positive. The ballot measure passes in May. How soon would you start? So um, we are pursuing a number of grants to help support this project occurring. So just so everybody in the room is aware, based on the geological and environmental impact to this site, this site never gets done without public support. Um, we are pursuing currently a raise grant from the Department of Transportation at the federal level. Um, Oregon City is the applicant because you have to be a um, federally recognized tribe, nonprofit, or municipality for almost every grant to address these types of sites, uh, which is interesting because the private sector actually owns the majority, but we don't have access to any of those funds. So we have partnered with Oregon City and Oregon Department of Transportation would actually administer those funds. Um, that is a $17 million grant we have to provide a local match of 20%, so 3.4 million. So again, it's, it's how do we leverage dollars to get the most benefit for the community. Um, there's also a congressional discretionary spending grant that we've submitted on. And, and so Department of Transportation will hear in July. Um, CDS, Congressional Discretionary Spending, will hear in probably December. Uh, Senate Bill 630, this is an opportunity to actually show here is a landfill and this is how it can be beneficial. I mentioned those 55 landfills just in the Portland metro area. Are we creating more or less landfills every single day? We better figure out what to do with them and how to do it safely and how it can be beneficial for the community. And so Senate Bill 630, I actually have a work session in 20 minutes, I gotta jump on. Um, but that is a $15 million pilot program to show that this type of project can work. And Senator Meek is the sponsor of that. There's actually five senators on it, three Democrats, two Republicans, bipartisan. Um, we will know, this is the Senate Committee on Energy and Environment, and we will know, I believe by April 4th, whether that gets moved out to uh, Ways and Means. Uh, and then the last one is obviously the ballot measure. And, and let's be honest, when I go and try to convince the federal government that this is a project worth investing in, or the state government that this is a project worth investing in, what is the first question they ask? What has the city committed? The city's going to get the property taxes. The city's going to get the infrastructure. They get the most benefit. What have they done? And it makes a very difficult argument for me if I say they've chosen not to contribute. Fair enough? So, Ouch. So, Ouch. <laughs> so, so assuming, assuming we have the public funds lined up by the end of this year, you then move into the private funds. Private funds will not be an issue. Every discussion we've had about this location about the quality of Oregon City, about a location at 205 and 213, 
about providing housing as well as other services the community has communicated to us, um, we have a number of investors that are like, great, tell us when you get through. It's the same conversation we have with specific retail tenants that have been tracking the site for 20 years. And in every single case, the conversation I have is, we're not sure you will ever get this through Oregon City, but if you do, we want to be there. So we could start, I believe you have to, I believe May to October is the allowable time period for Mass X. So we would hope that we could break ground by May of next year. And All that's, right. Yeah. And that's why we've been working on the DDP at our risk, continuing to move forward engineering plans and approvals. So when we get the funds, we're not, okay, what do we do now? We've actually progressed to the point where we can keep the momentum going forward. And, and just so you know, this event is sponsored by the Oregon City Business Alliance. And as Seth alludes to the legislative bill 630 that he's got a work session on today at one o'clock, the Oregon City Business Alliance did submit a letter of support to the legislature to uh, Senator Meek stating the reasons why we feel it is a good utilization of that funding to turn a brownfield into a greenfield. And we also placed a statement under the voters pamphlet, uh, which I think today is the deadline for them to go in. Yesterday. yesterday was the deadline, so we put it in yesterday, also in support of the Abernathy Green Project. So hopefully the city commission, obviously the planning commission is voted unanimously. Hopefully the city commission recognizes the same thing we recognize at the Oregon City Business Alliance what a tremendous beneficial uh, economic opportunity, historical, cultural, every way you want to look at it. So then the other side of the coin, and I don't want you to spend a lot of time on this because we have a lot of other questions, what if the ballot measure doesn't pass? So then we start looking at other alternatives like vertical housing tax credits, right? Um, some people have asked, why aren't you already pursuing that? And the answer is, if we're asking for urban renewal funds, which is then paid back by property taxes, and then we go and reduce our property taxes by 20% per floor above the first floor, to me, that feels like double dipping. And other people can do that. I wouldn't be comfortable doing that. So we would look at vertical housing tax credits, but it doesn't change the fact that I still have a very difficult argument with the other levels of government. We'll, we'll continue to pursue. Um, the RAISE grant, the CDS, there's four other federal grants that they haven't announced the information yet. I mean, the whole intent of this chasing public funds is if we can get enough money from the federal and state, then what we're asking of the Urban Renewal Commission is a smaller number. So what I requested of the Urban Renewal Commission is that they consider up to $30 million. And I didn't ask for a hard number because we're out there pounding the pavement, trying to get as many other sources of funds as possible. Well, let's hope the one side of the coin I started out with is the result that we get. Um, you mentioned that you're going to have over 500 units of housing. Have you already kind of predetermined what mix that would be in the way of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, possibly some larger units than that? what the uh, product mix and the matrix for uh, the, the rents would be, because everybody knows rents have been going up over the last few years in the metro region. And if there are a portion of that would be set aside for more affordable uh, rental product. Quite a few components to that. So, so first off, where are we? It's a complex project. Yeah, it, yes. <laughs> really? Uh, <laughs> in, in, in terms of um, figuring out what you would call the program. So what unit types and what percentages? Usually the standard starting point is 40% studios, 40% one bedrooms, 20% two bedrooms. And then you adjust that based on, is there a demand for three bedrooms? You go to CoStar, which is a report that shows all the operating assets in the area, and you say, okay, wh where is there a deficiency currently in Oregon City? Um, so we have 521 units, I believe is what was in our general development plan. 
That's just a basic floor layout for each of the five buildings based on 40, 40, 20. So the reason why our general development plan says 500 to 600 units, as we start laying out each individual building, each individual floor, that's going to that's gonna move a bit. And, and the market is not stagnant. So six months from now, there may be a different metric we're trying to meet than today. Just like we continue to take in public input and incorporate it into the design. So uh, until the day that we submit our permit drawings, there is variability. Um, in regards to price points, a couple of comments there. Number one, the three buildings that are on top of the parking garage, they're four stories. The reason that is, so we can do type five dimensional lumber framing. Um, the cost, the rents that you need to support a project going forward is partially based upon what is the cost to produce that product. So if you're using a simpler product type, a more cost efficient product type, you can keep your rents lower. The two buildings inward are, the, they'll probably end up being four over one. So your first floor is concrete type one, the four levels above will end up being type five wood. Another reason we're doing that, in a city, are all the buildings the same size? No, you have different heights. We want different product type. And um, when we do the analysis based on, and this was 2021, um, Clackamas County, half of our units are gonna hit that 80% median family income range. Um, there's also the option Related Northwest, Steph Condor, great um, developers specifically of affordable housing. We know that's not our forte. Our forte is market rate mixed use. We'd bring in a partner. Another reason we, brought up, we broke up the housing in the five units, we can take one of those buildings and say, we're going to sell that parcel specifically to affordable housing developer. Have um, you ever considered doing attached housing condominiums, and have you looked into the cost of using cross-laminated timber? Um, so first off, there's a large percentage of architects and GCs in Oregon that have a condominium exclusion. And the reason that is is because the HOA at nine years and 364 days sues everybody involved. For every scuff on the wall, every crack of drywall. Um, there's a reason why you don't see the number of condos in Oregon that you see in other states. Um, it's a 10-year statute of repose or statute of liability. And until that changes, um, there's just too much risk there. There's, there's yeah. also, with the PPA, figuring out how we address that. Is each condo owner now signing up for some of the environmental liability? Yeah, that would be a wreck. How about the cross-laminated timber? I would love to use cross-laminated timber. We looked at manufactured plywood panels for a mid-rise building we had in southeast Portland. There's a great factory right near Detroit Lake. The challenge right now is when you compare it to some of the traditional uh, structure types, for, for one-story retail, it makes no sense. Um, right now... Once you get over a five over three structure until you get to about 13 stories where concrete makes sense, PT, that gap is perfect for cross-laminated timber. So there's a very specific market area right now where it makes sense. When there's additional demand, you're going to see that cost come down, and it will probably be competitive with steel and concrete, but it's, it's not there yet. And I agree with you on the condos, because I've been at the legislature pushing for construction defect reform to reduce the statute of limitations down from 10 years to six years. I think in Seattle, it's six or seven. R or rental, rental is six years in Oregon. Yeah. yeah. So a so, couple, um, you've been to a lot of neighborhood associations. You've been to a lot of nonprofits. With the increase of 500 and so, some additional units, is that a negative impact on our schools? Are our schools ready to handle that capacity? Thank you. We, we, we didn't uh, coordinate beforehand, but a lot of, I hear that concern, right? How, how are we impacting the current 
uh, ability for the schools to have any kids that are on our site, right? Uh, somebody in one meeting said, you're going to have 500 kids. I don't know if we're going to have one kid on average per unit. I, I think that's a reach. Um, and then the other question is, how do you impact schools funding? I think everybody or a lot of people understand how school funding works, right? The state provides about two-thirds of it. Um, there's a local match or a local co contribution amount, and it's on a per head basis. So um, having more students actually means your schools are getting more funding. The second component is do we have enough school capacity currently? Um, and there's a great study done by PSU that analyzes 2011 through 2031 Oregon City School District. What is the anticipated increase in students? 1.5%. So what we've heard, having reached out to the school districts, having done projects with the school districts, is this project could actually be a benefit by increasing their budget, by increasing the number of students, and based on current anticipation of enrollment, um, we're not going to put a dent in it. Okay, great. I appreciate that. Um, in looking at your master plan, we see massive massings of buildings. Is it your intent to go ahead and build the entire project out yourself, or would you sell portions of it off to individual developers who focus on apartments or focus on grocery stores, focus on a, another type of use of some kind? But you kind of do the transportation of the private roads, create all the infrastructure, and then sell off pads. Um, so I try not to use the word massive ever when describing or ma this massive. project. Massive. Okay. okay. Um, My correction. <laughs> um, in terms of giving up control of what is on the site, when you've been interacting for three years with the community, and you've made commitments around what is going to be included in the project. Uh, I have a lot of trepidation around giving up that control. So we could partner with specific developers for specific sites. We could have 23 parcels here. And there's somebody that says, I have a relationship with this national retailer, and we want to be on this location, but we want to self-develop it. OK, terrific. Let's talk about that. Um, your five housing buildings, one of them should be affordable. Great, that's not our forte. We bring in somebody that's better at it than we are. Um, so I anticipate that there will be portions that, that are broken off. It is gonna be a very specific curated process. We are, we are not a land developer. We, do, we don't just entitle and break up a piece of property and then sell it off to the highest bidders. We're actually looking at the overall vision. And if there's somebody that is better at producing certain components that are going to meet the commitments we've made, of course we'll have those discussions. And I know you've been involved with a lot of projects where the architectural review and the, the utilization of natural materials is evident throughout the entire interior and exterior and the, the hardscapes. Uh, you, you may have read where we have kind of a climate change situation taking place, and the city of Eugene recently adopted an ordinance doing away with gas in all new construction. With the direction seeming to go away from fossil fuels to a, a cleaner, net zero environment, are, are you looking at electrifying everything within this facility and, and not offering gas like Eugene has now voted? Does that thought even entered your mind? We, we've actually had a lot of discussions around that. Um, it is balancing what your tenants actually want and what is best for the environment and finding that middle ground. Um, the state has been very aggressive. So for instance, um, there's a climate friendly act that has been enforced. As of January 1st of this year, if you're a certain distance from major transit infrastructure um, and you're doing multifamily, guess what? You don't have to provide any parking. Were, were people aware of that? It's been pretty quiet. 
the way they roll it out, as of the end of this month, multifamily, 40% of all your units have to be prepped, all your stalls have to be prepped for electrical vehicle charging. And it's interesting because we talk about how we don't have enough housing because it's so difficult to produce. And then you look at these goals, which are in the right place, but all they're doing is increasing the cost of development. And I know that wasn't your question. That's just my soapbox no, for the day. Seems like I read about it every day. Yes. So um, I'm a lead AP, U.S. Green Building Council, has been, have been since 2009. I've done a number of Green Glow projects. I've done a number of gold, platinum, lead certified projects. There will be a sustainable component to this. Taking a step back, what is more sustainable than doing mixed use on the most environmentally and geotechnically blighted site in a city? So that is instead of going to greenfield and taking forest and farmland, right? So that, that's decision number one, that we are doing something that's sustainable. We're, we're, we're trying to take the worst site and find out how can we make it beneficial for the community. And then, yeah, natural gas, electric, uh, that's a big one. It's interesting because depending on who, you, which industry they represent when you're talking to individuals, Gas will tell you that electricity is generated and causes more pollution than the gas ever could. Um, gas appliances are becoming more and more efficient and safer. And so as technologies change, you're also balancing those things. Well, and you mentioned sustainable, Seth. And I think that's one of the reasons why Metro designated that location as a regional center because they don't really want truck delivery, trucks of all the supplies driving all through city streets. You're right on I-205 and Highway 213. You minimize the impacts on the local residential streets with all the automobile traffic that would be leaving from where they live to go to work. You get on the freeway or you go up to Clackamas Town Center and you get on Max or you get on TriMet. So speaking of that, have you had conversations with TriMet about if they would do a, any type of a transit center on your site? So um, we've had very preliminary discussions, but we've actually designed at that main intersection right at the end of the entertainment building, a covered area, benches. It's a logical place for a bus going either way across the site along that spine. So we, we've planned for it. Then we will have to convince TriMet that there's enough additional demand based on what we're putting on the site to, to add routes. Okay, and I know you've got to go to a one o'clock meeting. Uh, That's speaking a big of pile. Those, pardon me? <laughs> that's a big pile of questions. Well, I, a lot of them are the same. <laughs> okay. So that's good. Um, have you talked to the services community, the police about having possibly a, a presence, because crime is something that everybody's concerned about these days. The fire department may be having a, a satellite station that's much smaller, but something that could be there in case there's an emergency, medical facilities with defibrillators in case there's heart attacks, having small satellite service facilities provided by those type of entities? Um, so we sat down with the police department. They were one of these 18 meetings that we've had between February and April and had a discussion around just educating them about the site. Um, that's the first step. Right? Making sure everybody knows this is what's actually proposed and this is how it lays out. What are your concerns? So we have started that discussion with the police department. We've reached out to the fire department. We haven't had that discussion yet. Um, I anticipate those discussions will occur over the rest of this year. Okay. And looking at your facility as the anchor, the hub for the north end, Confederated Tribe of the Grand Ron is an anchor hub on the south end. Main Street connected. Um, is there any thought about honoring the indigenous people at your location? And have you, in your conversations with your staff, discussed diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of your mission statement? Uh, so again, a few components to that question. Um, so first off, Abernathy Green, 
that was based on, we, we have a Facebook site. I don't know if anybody here enjoys social media. It is a cesspool of negativity. I've, I've never been involved with social media. It is painful. And so there have been a number of things like what brands are you interested in? What uses are you interested in? Hey, here's some potential names for the site. And so um, based on the history of that site, Abernathy Green was one of the ones that we had proposed. And seem to have the most support. One of the questions asked was, how are you supporting the indigenous people? Um, it is my personal opinion that if the confederated tribes of the Grand Ron are doing Tamwata Village, that is the appropriate place to honor that heritage. And um, I wouldn't be comfortable trying to do that. Um, we had a discussion with them early on in our design process and asked, what are you putting on the site? And so they had the cultural center, potentially a hotel overlooking the falls, mixed use, residential, office, retail. And part of the reason why we don't have a hotel on our site is because there's one planned near the site and then potentially on this site as well. So we're, we're looking at all these pieces and where do we fit in? Um, we don't want to create more competition than required. We'd, we'd rather all these developments support one another. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, and then the DEI. Yeah. Uh, so we have a DEI component in all of our RFPs. So when we brought on Lee Crutcher Lewis as our pre-con, we have an MWESB requirement. Um, same with LRS. So that is a component that we take into consideration when we're building the team from day one. Um, so yes. All right, what's your watch say? I'm a minute over. Okay, <laughs> we got him extra, we got a bonus. <laughs> thank you, Seth, thank, thank yeah. you very much. And I gotta let you know, he didn't know any of these questions. These came from the audience or my board prepared them. So, these answers he wasn't able to prepare for. So what the answers he's given you is exactly how he's thinking.